Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program. I have a story on Canada's relationship with the British Crown. Jill Robbins reports on ancient ruins in Iraq, and Faith Perlow explains the difference between the words energy and power. We finish by listening to a story by Kate Chopin called "A Pair of Silk Stockings," but first. Canada has deep historical ties to Britain, and many Canadians generally liked Queen Elizabeth II. But a growing number of Canadians do not want the British monarch to represent them. The risks that come with constitutional reform, however, mean there is little political wish for change. Britain colonized Canada beginning in the late 1500s. The country formally remained part of the British Empire until 1982. Now it is a member of the Commonwealth of former Empire countries that have the British monarch as head of state. A public opinion study by Canada's Angus Reid Institute in April found that 51% of Canadians do not want the monarchy to continue as its head of state. That is up from 45 percent in January 2020. Only 26 percent said it should continue. In addition, a new opinion study by the group Leger found that about 77 percent of Canadians said they feel no attachment to the British monarchy. Many Canadians felt sorry for the royal family after the death of the Queen. But many find their relationship with the British monarch to be strange. Those from Quebec, the mostly French-speaking province, feel even less connection with Britain. In the Angus Reid study, 71 percent of people living in Quebec said they no longer see a need for the monarchy. 20 percent of Canada's population is new to the country, with little connection to Britain. And indigenous or native people usually feel little warmth for the colonial power. Nigan Sinclair is a professor of indigenous studies at the University of Manitoba. In an article for the Winnipeg Free Press, he said, "Besides a whole lot of photo opportunities alongside chiefs in headdresses, the reign of Queen Elizabeth will forever be marked." By inaction, pro-monarchy Canadians and observers say the constitutional monarchy is a well-functioning democratic system. They also say changing the system would be both complex and politically risky. The massive constitutional effort of removing the crown would inevitably invite many other suggestions for constitutional change. Canada went down this road in the 1980s and 1990s, and the country nearly collapsed from all the competing demands," said Jonathan Malloy. He is a professor of political science at Ottawa's Carleton University. At least seven provincial legislatures, representing more than 50 percent of the population, plus Parliament, must approve constitutional reforms. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked about his position on the monarchy on Tuesday. Without fully supporting the monarchy or removing the chance for debate, Trudeau said his government will work on the issues important to Canadians. Once the Iraqi town of Hatra was under the control of the Islamic State or IS militant group. Now. Visitors can walk peacefully through the UNESCO World Heritage Site in the northern part of Iraq. 
local leaders are trying to bring tourists back to the area after the invaders almost destroyed the ancient ruins. Hatra dates back to more than 2,300 years ago. It takes about two hours to drive there from Mosul, the former capital of IS. Iraqi and coalition forces recaptured Mosul in 2017. On Saturday, the first group of tourists arrived. A private museum in Mosul arranged the trip for about 40 visitors, most of them Iraqis. They walked around the more than 2,000-year-old ruins as the sun began to go down. The tourists took photos of themselves in front of walkways. They inspected the stone structures that the IS extremists damaged. Luna Batata is a 33-year-old visiting Hatra with her Belgian husband. It has great history, she said. A native of Iraq, Patata left her homeland 24 years ago. This is the first time she has returned. Visiting Hatra caused her to have mixed feelings, she said. You see bullet holes. You see many empty bullets. Hatra was an important religious and trading center under the Parthian Empire. It had high, thick walls for defense and magnificent temples. The buildings combined Greek and Roman building designs with Asian decorations. In 2015, IS released a video showing its militants destroying some of the sculptures at Hatra, firing guns at them and cutting them with tools. Some of the sculptures have been repaired. In February, officials showed three figures experts had returned to their earlier appearance. Five years after the defeat of IS, Mosul and its surroundings have gone back to feeling more normal. But efforts to make repairs have met with problems, and many areas still show the results of the fight against the extremists. Many visitors, especially ones from the West, are now exploring the country. Some even go to Mosul. The Mosul Heritage House is a private museum that opened in June. It organized the tour of Hatra. Those in the Hatra group were among the first visitors. They came at a time when the U.S., British, and other governments are warning their citizens against travel to Iraq. They say there are still risks of terrorism, kidnapping, armed conflict, and civil unrest. An incident involving a British tourist, James Fitton, may have hurt tourism in Iraq. Fitton was arrested in March and condemned to 15 years in jail over pieces of pottery he picked up at an archaeological site. In July, a court reversed the decision and he flew back home. Religious tourism to the Shiite holy cities of Karbala and Najaf has been growing, mostly from Iran. Some major problems remain, however. Services and transportation for tourists are still basic in Iraq. Although the country is rich in oil, there has been much damage from the years of fighting. Beriar Baha al-Din is a doctoral student in anthropology at the University of Exeter in Britain. He was part of the group visiting Hatra. He said, Mosul isn't only war, IS, terrorism. Mosul is a civilization, heritage, culture. It should be full of tourists from across the globe. I'm Jill Robbins. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question from Max in Ukraine about the difference between energy and power. Dear Learning English, I'm Max from Ukraine. 
I'm improving my English by listening and viewing materials in VOA. I have a question about the difference in the meaning of two similar words, energy and power. Thank you, Max. Dear Max, thank you for this interesting question. These words are commonly used interchangeably, meaning they are used in place of each other. But there are important differences in use under some conditions. Let's start with how these two words differ in the study of science. Energy is the ability to do work or create some kind of physical change. For example, energy is used to lift a box. The amount of energy to lift the box is the same. But what if you can lift the box faster than someone else? This is where the word power comes in. Power is how fast the work or change is done. In the field of physics, power is often measured in watts. An energy-saving light bulb will use about 10 to 15 watts of power. Energy, as a noun, can describe the ability to do physical activities. It can be the feeling of life and enthusiasm that you use to complete tasks. If you have low or no energy, you may feel tired or run down. Energy can be temporary. You may have a lot of energy in the morning, but by the afternoon, you may not have any energy. Coffee gives me energy, but it quickly wears off. Power, as a noun, can mean the ability or capacity to do something. It can also mean that it is within your means or you have the resources to do something. This meaning has an association that power is naturally available. I don't have the brain power to finish my homework tonight. To have power means that you have control over something. If you have power, you have the ability and legal right to do something. To come into power or take power in a country means that a person or group controls it in some way. King Charles III took on the powers of the British monarchy after his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, died. We can also use power to talk about energy resources, like nuclear and electricity. Nuclear power is environmentally friendly. Power can also be a verb, meaning to provide energy to make something operate. Batteries power our smart devices, like cell phones. Please let us know if these examples have helped you, Max. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. Our story today is called A Pair of Silk Stockings. It was written by Kate Chopin. Here is Barbara Klein with the story. Little Mrs. Summers one day found herself the unexpected owner of $15. It seemed to her a very large amount of money. 
the way it filled up her worn money holder gave her a feeling of importance that she had not enjoyed for years. The question of investment was one she considered carefully. For a day or two, she walked around in a dreamy state as she thought about her choices. She did not wish to act quickly and do anything she might regret. During the quiet hours of the night, she lay awake considering ideas. A dollar or two could be added to the price she usually paid for her daughter Janie's shoes. This would guarantee they would last a great deal longer than usual. She would buy cloth for new shirts for the boys. Her daughter Mag should have another dress. And still, there would be enough left for new stockings, two pairs per child. What time that would save her in always repairing old stockings. The idea of her little family looking fresh and new for once in their lives made her restless with excitement. The neighbors sometimes talked of the better days that little Miss Summers had known before she had ever thought of being Mrs. Summers. She herself never looked back to her younger days. She had no time to think about the past. The needs of the present took all her energy. Mrs. Summers knew the value of finding things for sale at reduced prices. She could stand for hours making her way little by little toward the desired object that was selling below cost. She could push her way if need be. But that day she was tired and a little bit weak. She had eaten a light meal no, she thought about her day. Between getting the children fed and the house cleaned and preparing herself to go shopping, she had forgotten to eat at all. When she arrived at the large department store, she sat in front of an empty counter. She was trying to gather strength and courage to push through a mass of busy shoppers. She rested her hand upon the counter. She wore no gloves. She slowly grew aware that her hand had felt something very pleasant to touch. She looked down to see that her hand lay upon a pile of silk stockings. A sign nearby announced that they had been reduced in price. A young girl who stood behind the counter asked her if she wished to examine the silky leg coverings. She smiled as if she had been asked to inspect diamond jewelry with the aim of purchasing it. But she went on feeling the soft, costly items. Now... She used both hands, holding the stockings up to see the light shine through them. Two red marks suddenly showed on her pale face. She looked up at the shop girl. Do you think there are any size eights and a half among these? There were a great number of stockings in her size. Mrs. Summers chose a black pair and looked at them closely. A dollar and ninety-eight cents, she said aloud. Well, I will buy this pair. She handed the girl a five-dollar bill and waited for her change and the wrapped box with the stockings. What a very small box it was. It seemed lost in her worn old shopping bag. Mrs. Summers then took the elevator 
which carried her to an upper floor into the lady's rest area. In an empty corner, she replaced her cotton stockings for the new silk ones. For the first time, she seemed to be taking a rest from the tiring act of thought. She had let herself be controlled by some machine-like force that directed her actions and freed her of responsibility. How good was the touch of the silk on her skin! She felt like lying back in the soft chair and enjoying the richness of it. She did for a little while. Then she put her shoes back on and put her old stockings into her bag. Next, she went to the shoe department, sat down, and waited to be fitted. The young shoe salesman was unable to guess about her background. He could not resolve her worn old shoes with her beautiful new stockings. She tried on a pair of new boots. She held back her skirts and turned her feet one way and her head another way as she looked down at the shiny, pointed boots. Her foot and ankle looked very lovely. She could not believe that they were a part of herself. She told the young salesman that she wanted an excellent and stylish fit. She said... She did not mind paying extra as long as she got what she desired. After buying the new boots, she went to the glove department. It was a long time since Mrs. Summers had been fitted with gloves. When she had bought a pair, they were always bargains, so cheap that it would have been unreasonable to have expected them to be fitted to her hand. Now she rested her arm on the counter where gloves were for sale. A young shop girl drew a soft leather glove over Mrs. Summer's hand. She smoothed it down over the wrist and buttoned it neatly. Both women lost themselves for a second or two as they quietly praised the little gloved hand. <laughs> Other places where money might be spent. A store down the street sold books and magazines. Mrs. Summers bought two costly magazines that she used to read back when she had been able to enjoy other pleasant things. She lifted her skirts as she crossed the street. Her new stockings and boots and gloves had worked wonders for her appearance. They had given her a feeling of satisfaction, a sense of belonging to the well-dressed crowds. She was very hungry. Another time, she would have ignored the desire for food until reaching her own home. But the force that was guiding her would not permit her to act on such a thought. There was a restaurant at the corner. She had never entered its doors, she had sometimes looked through the windows. She had noted the white tablecloths, shining glasses, and waiters serving wealthy people. When she entered, her appearance created no surprise or concern, as she had half feared it might. She seated herself at a small table. A waiter came at once to take her order. She ordered six oysters, a chop, something sweet, a glass of wine, and a cup of coffee. While waiting to be served, she removed her gloves very slowly and set them beside her. Then she picked up her magazine and looked through it. It was all very agreeable. The tablecloths were even more clean and white than they had seemed through the window, and the crystal drinking glasses shined even more brightly. 
there were ladies and gentlemen who did not notice her lunching at the small tables like her own. A pleasing piece of music could be heard, and a gentle wind was blowing through the window. She tasted a bite, and she read a word or two, and she slowly drank the wine. She moved her toes around in the silk stockings. The price of it all made no difference. When she was finished, she counted the money out to the waiter and left an extra coin on his tray. He bowed to her as if she were a princess of royal blood. There was still money in her purse, and her next gift to herself presented itself as a theater advertisement. When she entered the theater, the play had already begun. She sat between richly dressed women who were there to spend the day eating sweets and showing off their costly clothing. There were many others who were there only to watch the play. It is safe to say there was no one there who had the same respect that Mrs. Summers did for her surroundings. She gathered in everything, stage and players and people, in one wide sensation. She laughed and cried at the play. She even talked a little with the women. One woman wiped her eyes with a small square of lace and passed Mrs. Summers her box of candy. The play was over, the music stopped, the crowd flowed outside. It was like a dream ended. Mrs. Summers went to wait for the cable car. A man with sharp eyes sat opposite her. It was hard for him to fully understand what he saw in her expression. In truth, he saw nothing, unless he was a magician. Then he would sense her heartbreaking wish that the cable car would never stop anywhere, but go on and on with her forever.